Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and learn leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. I'm delighted to be here with you today. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I am your host. We have a very special guest here today with us, Serena Shu. Thank you so much for being here. Please say hi to our listeners. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Bertine, so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to this and I, I especially like it because, you know, for full disclosure, Serena and I are friends and we've known each other for a while, a very long time. And I love the work that you've been doing um, on social media with regard to finances. And I'm going to tell the audience a little bit more about you. Serena joined John Baker Financial Group in 2014 as a para planner. Over the years, her role has evolved from analytics and support to serving and relationship building with clients. She previously worked at an online discount brokerage firm, educating high net worth clients on equity compensation plans. Prior to that, she performed conflict analysis at an Atlanta area law firm. That's where we met. <laughs> Serena received her bachelor's in business administration from Mercer University's Stetson School of Business and Economics in Macon and a master's of business administration in personal finance planning from Georgia State University's Robinson College of Business. She currently holds the designation of Certified Financial Planner Practitioner. She also holds the Series 7, 63, and 65 licenses. Serena grew up in Smyrna, Georgia, and currently resides in Midtown. She enjoys spending time with family and friends, trying out new and old restaurants, traveling, and yoga. She also volunteers on the board of directors for the Financial Planning Association of Georgia, also known as FPA of Georgia. Serena, once again, welcome to our show. Thank you so much. Congratulations on the Series 7, 63, and 65 licenses. That is no small feat, and I particularly love that you are a woman who is in this field, and I think because primarily representation is so very important. So I'm delighted on so many levels that you could be here with us and, and really just help educate our listeners. And so I want you to tell us a bit more about your professional background and your training and your company. As you mentioned uh, in my bio, I am a financial advisor. The firm that I work at is John Baker Financial Group. The office is located in Dunwoody around the Perimeter Mall area. Um, I've been at the firm for actually about five and a half years now. and. I started out wanting to be more behind the scenes, learning how to crunch the numbers and figure out how all the, the pieces of the puzzle fit together. But over time, slowly and gradually, I've been wanting to become more and more client facing because to be able to see people's reactions and to be able to educate people about how their financial plans are doing is really gratifying for me. Um, so as much as I love the number crunching aspect of it, I also love the people interaction of it and being able to help women in particular, especially working women, professional women, to get the financial clarity that they need to ensure their futures are secure is of supreme importance to me. So I really enjoy and love what I do. 
I love that you said that financial clarity. I've never heard that particular term before, but yet it's so apropos and I think it's so timely. Not everyone is aware of what financial clarity means and that's not only a generational difference, but a cultural one as well. So Serena, tell us a bit about your experience with diversity and inclusion, either personal or professional or both. Well, so as far as professionally, um, the financial services industry and I'm not sure if your, your audience is aware, but the financial services industry is predominantly made up of white men, um, and in particular, older white men. Um, and I, I knew that before I started my journey into this space. I was very fortunate to find a lot of men and women from all backgrounds who are open to having conversations with me as I was looking to transition in this industry. Uh, some women in particular took me under their wings and guided me through the beginning stages of my career. And I still keep in touch with some of those folks to this day. But getting into the industry was for me the easiest part. I was young, I was educated, and I had the financial wherewithal to make that change. Since I've been in the industry, I'm kind of seeing a different side of that same coin. So while I haven't explicitly experienced anything negative due to my race or my gender, and for that I'm really thankful, um, I have noticed that people tend to congregate or speak with others who look like them, right? They tend to work with people who look like them, whether it's white men working with white men or a person of color working with a person of color. And it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, old or young, that's just how it is. And I think, honestly, that comes down to an unconscious bias because there's a certain comfort in knowing that the person across the table from you has probably experienced the same things you have and knows where you're coming from. So that tends to make things challenging from a business perspective, figuring out how to push past that unconscious bias. Interestingly enough, I'm actually experiencing more of an age bias versus race or gender in this industry. Um, I look younger than I really am. You do. And, <laughs> For right. those that can't see you, she really does. <laughs> Which is a great compliment now and of course maybe 40, 50 years from now. But the people I network with tend to associate me more with their adult children. That's just something I'm very conscious of and it's something I'm very aware of when I'm approaching conversations with people. And really what I end up doing is trying to just connect them at a basic human level. You know, you don't have to look and act exactly the same way to make a connection. That being said, I am the only female advisor in my office. We're a small firm, we're about 10 people or so, and I'm the only female advisor. So the only other woman in the office is the receptionist. So there's a little bit of an imbalance there. I'm also the only person of color in my office. So, you know, when I first started working at this firm, I was very, very conscious about not doing the quote unquote housework around the office, right? So just making coffee or attending to the trash bins or what have you. Very, very conscious because as women, we tend to want to nurture. It spans beyond the family. It tends to just kind of go everywhere with you. Um, it carries through to all parts of our lives, but that's not what I was hired to do. So I'm not going to do it. And like many women, I often have the experience where my opinion isn't heard unless a male coworker has said it. So <laughs> very popular experience amongst this gender. Um, and this is something I've been working on over the past year or two is how to better assert my opinions in team conversations. And even that is a nuanced decision because depending on how you come across, maybe you come across as too aggressive versus too assertive, right? There's always these layers. Um, but I've been very fortunate that my coworkers respect me and they respect the contributions that I make to the company. Um, that, and I know there's also a conscious effort on my firm's part to hire people from backgrounds, but I've seen over the years that the issue kind of becomes a little bit of a chicken and egg conundrum because how can we hire somebody with a diverse background if we ourselves don't have a diverse firm, right? How can we attract diversity when we ourselves are not that diverse? So it's this weird dynamic that takes place that even though we would like to become more diverse, it's just difficult to do that from where we are right now. Right, right. It's creating those pathways that are so complicated because like you said, there are many things that are nuanced and we have to navigate those roads with caution, right? But at the same time, we have to be aggressive about how we're going to portray our, ourselves and our firm, right? There are so many jewels that you just dropped there for us. So the one thing I will touch upon for sure is doing the housework because this is something in my interviews with women um, at various levels of their career, this is what they're always expected to do. And so I love that you mentioned that because you are the only woman in your company. You are in a senior position, right? And so what is interesting is that people still expect us to perhaps take notes 
act as the secretary. And while there's nothing wrong with being the secretary at all, that's not what you're there for, right? And I always, I notice that even in board meetings, people always look to, it could be, um, and I'll recall a, a recent event where a colleague in a board meeting, she's a seasoned attorney and she's an attorney for her entire county. And she was the secretary on the board. And I'm thinking, anybody else could have been chosen to do this, you know, and I found that to be really just a huge disparity, just consistently seeing that. And then what you mentioned about an unconscious bias, insofar as people congregating together who happen to look the same, right? It's usually because they, they have a perceived shared interest. And I say perceived because we could have, for instance, you and I, we look completely different, but yet there are things that we have in common, right? Besides both being women of color, besides both being of a certain age, there are so many more things that we could talk about. But I often find when I go to places as well that you do see these groups just forming and people don't even realize they're doing that. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, Trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. I think a part of that is is due to our our reptilian brain, if we will, because it likes patterns. But but the problem with that, you know, as opposed to using our modern brain, is that our modern brain is what makes us so interesting because you know we're inquisitive and we want to learn about ourselves and others. You're just bringing back all of these experiences that that I've heard and or experienced myself. So I, I found that to be. I find it to be very interesting how it's always the same, even though the person might change, right? The experience is the same. And But I commend your firm, though, for being open about conversations, right? Willing to have those conversations, I have to say, I think is the first step, because that means there's an openness to change, to become more inclusive, to become more diverse, wouldn't you say? Right, exactly. I think having the conversation is a very important first step. Um, it's figuring out what the next steps are and kind of following through on the next steps that really need to happen. So then in your experience, what are the general habits you find in the spending and the saving habits of millennials versus age groups? Because now we're going to talk about money and what we do with it. Well, so before I kind of dive deep into that, I just want to take a step back and point out that the millennial generation itself is a very broad one. So generally speaking, millennials were born somewhere between the early 80s to late 90s. Been a lot of articles and books and things written now that kind of distinguish there's actually two kind of subsets of millennials. One of them is a younger millennial and one of them is an older millennial. Mm -hmm. um, I personally identify with the older millennial. Um, you know, you look like a younger millennial. <laughs> like a younger one or even potentially Gen Z. This delineation is distinguished by technology, you know, the internet, like who had it and when. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's defined by that 2008, 2009 recession. Um, because a lot of younger millennials were still in school when that happened, but older millennials were in the workforce around that time. Kind of a couple of kisms there as far mm -hmm. as the, the generation goes. Um, but as far as that's concerned with technology, um, there's a huge focus on convenience for millennials in general, right? And they don't mind spending money on it. Um, previous generations didn't really grow up with that same access mm -hmm. um, or even with the same companies that you hear about today, like Googles and Facebooks and such. As far as housing goes, a lot of millennials end up renting versus owning compared to older generations like boomers. Um, and boomers were born kind of in the mid 40s to mid 60s or so. But there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, some of them has to do with student loans. 
Um, the millennial generation just has a lot more debt on their plates. There's a huge focus on careers. There's also delaying marriage and children for this particular generation. I would like to say kind of largely the mindset of this generation is that they want to be financially stable uh, first before they kind of really establish some milestones in their lives. With respect to food and dining out, millennials spend the most compared to previous generations. And I think that's reflective of their preference or my preference to spend money on experiences versus things. Um, I know for me personally, food is um, an avenue to get people together. It's a social lubricant, not as good as alcohol, but it is a social lubricant in terms of getting people to come together. And there's a tendency with older generations to just kind of focus on having stuff. And that's not necessarily what millennials want, particularly if it comes down to passing down heirlooms from one generation to the next. I'm largely seeing a lot of millennials don't want stuff, you know, passed down to them. So I agree that, you know, experiences definitely take precedence over things. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, sometimes there are millennials that lean a little bit into that mantra too much. Uh, sometimes at the expense of saving for their future selves, right? The mentality can easily slip into, let's just live for today, um, but not necessarily think about tomorrow. Yeah. I'm gonna kind of whipsaw you a little bit though, because there are also some studies out there that say that millennials are the best generation of savers. I think that largely comes from those millennials who experienced the recession firsthand and were so impacted and hyper aware of how a lack of financial resources affects the rest of their lives, that that mentality was born from that experience. So it's really a mixed bag, depending on which type of millennial you speak with, as well as their own personal experiences with money. I love that you mentioned that, that there's diversity within the millennial group themselves, right? Age diversity. And so I had not even considered that before. So this is why I love having this show and speaking to people like you, because it, it not only, you know, helps our audience um, educate themselves, but it helps me educate myself and learn something and broaden my own horizons. So I thank you for that. I, I really do have to agree. I do feel, and I'm a Gen Xer, but I feel as if I have millennial tendencies. <laughs> and sometimes they may be younger millennial tendencies, but I do believe that experiences matter so much more than the stuff, right? Um, I can tell you, I happen to have a basement with stuff in it that I have not opened in over a decade. It's because, you know, I know some of them are meaningful family things, old pictures that, that do mean something to me, but yet they're still in a box. And I'm thinking to myself, why do we do this? You know, <laughs> and why do we do this? It's been a good 12 years. I have not opened some of those boxes. And I'm sure that when I do go back and forth in them, I find a surprise and I'm like, oh, this is wonderful. And I have to keep this. But I also know that if it's that important, then I should have it out. Right. Um, it's one of those things. And I agree with you. You know very well. I'm a fan of the dinner party. I love gathering people around for food. And and it doesn't even matter what type of food or, or the atmosphere really, um, meaning that it doesn't have to be fancy or it can be depending upon what our mood is. Right. It's just about getting people together and and cultivating this this air of togetherness and exchanging ideas. It, to me, that's so much more valuable. But then I want to touch upon something you said when you mentioned that millennials, younger ones tend to rent. Let's talk really quickly about the subscription lifestyle, because I, I saw an article you posted the other day, and I want you to talk to our group about that as well. But it was about the subscription lifestyle. Talk to us a little bit about what that is. Yes. So um, the article you're referring to had to do with on-demand services, mm -hmm. um, I believe. So on-demand services are things like Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Uber Eats, Grubhub. Um, basically, you know, it's a convenience. You can hit an app, make an order, and have it delivered to you very, very easily um, and from your phone. So I think with respect to that, and that kind of lends itself to that sort of subscription lifestyle. A uh, myriad examples I can even talk about, about how, you know, just things have gone from you need to own it to, you don't necessarily need to own it, you can just rent it or at least have access to it. I can't explain the, the thinking behind it. Um, I will largely point to maybe Apple iTunes 
as oh yes <laughs> point, as far as the the own versus rent piece you know it's happened with music it's happened with clothing like companies called rent the runway where you just borrow the clothes for a fee it kind of lends itself into that mentality of not necessarily needing to own stuff but it also has this lens of oh well this is super convenient for me i like having that ease of access and i think as we talk about generations that are kind of around our age and younger, it also lends itself to sort of a, an immediate gratification, if you will. For good or for ill, that's what it's becoming. Um, a little bit more of an ADD or ADHD type of society where I want what I want when I want it. That's, I don't know where that's going to go next. While I know the pendulum might swing the other way with the next generation or the generation after that, I just know it is what it is. And it's basically another thing that if you use it, that's fine. If you don't use it, that's also fine. Depending on where you're at financially, it might end up becoming a distraction or maybe it really truly is a convenience and you don't have the time to do X, Y, Z. So I think that also just boils down to where are you coming from? Why are you using it? Are you being responsible with it? Absolutely. You're making me recall so many things that that happened, but one in particular, I recall an experience where I locked my keys in my car by accident, but the first thing I reached for was my phone because I thought, okay, I'll call an Uber and then I'll be able to get into the house. And then I remember, um, you know, being able to open my garage with my phone as well. And I thought to myself, this is insane. If I had done this when I was little, right? Mind you, a 10 year old shouldn't drive, but let's say, you know, if I had done this when I was younger, um, there's no way that I would have been able to not only get back home, but have access to my home, right? And I just thought this is insane and fantastic at the same time. It was something that I really appreciated at that moment, but I also thought, look how far we've come, but oh my gosh, everything is on my phone. Technology has been a huge disruptor. And you know, some businesses have fallen by the wayside because of technology. Going along with your, the keys locked in the car analogy, um, you know, prior to having the ability to call Uber from your app, what would you have done? If you had had AAA, you could have called the 800 number, right? right. Mm -hmm. You didn't have AAA, let me, I, I have a similar story. I was stuck at a gas station and I accidentally locked my keys in my car and I was able to, with my smartphone, I ended up calling a number in order to get somebody to come out and get the keys out from my car. Right. But if I didn't have a smartphone, what would have been the alternative? Well, I probably would have walked into the gas station and asked the attendant for the yellow pages. Yes, <laughs> <try> yes. <laughs> and do the same thing, right? I am old enough to know what the yellow pages are. So right, for those of our listeners that are not, we used to use them, they were great, and now they're gone. Oh no. It went online and or went obsolete. So, you know, technology is great. It's great that we have it. Um, I think some of some of the pause that I have with it is is it really being put to good use. Yes, I, I concur on that. I really do. Let's go back to the cultural, well, the generational differences. So um, with regard to culture, let's mm -hmm. talk about uh, the general cultural differences in spending and saving that you encounter regarding our immigrant populations and their first generation adult children. So do you see any differences in spending and saving habits? Um, yes, and that's largely a byproduct of each um, populations experience. So with immigrant populations, when you say immigrant populations, my first thought goes to um, the folks who came from overseas to the States with, you know, barely anything to their mm -hmm. name. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, my parents were of that generation. So, you know, these, these people, um, sometimes they set up their own businesses, right? Sometimes they didn't, but if they did set up their own businesses, I would think that's largely to be more in control of their own destinies. Yes, indeed. But, but maybe it was also born out of necessity. You know, maybe nobody wanted to hire them. Um, they had to persevere under a lot of harsh conditions, um, not least of which are language barriers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think largely simply not knowing how the U.S. system works. And by system, I mean like legal framework, financial framework. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for those of us who are born in the States and just grew up with it, I think that's taken for granted. Um, 
compared to the immigrants who came before us, it's a really steep hill to climb um, as far as the understanding the systems, understanding English, and just kind of understanding also the cultural nuances of growing up in the States, because that's very different from growing up in your own home country. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the first generation adult children, so these are the kids of those immigrants, right? So those immigrants toiled away uh, for quite a long time to make sure that their kids had a better life than they did. And I think that's a universal desire from parent to child, regardless of what your background is and regardless of your experience, you always want your children to do better than you did. Um, but those first generation children, having grown up in the States, maybe they were born here, maybe they weren't, but they have a completely different lens on things. They have a completely different view. Yeah. So from their perspective, they saw their immigrant parents working ridiculous hours, working very hard. And the message that they were taught from a very young age is you need to focus on education. Education yeah. <laughs> is where you want to go. Education is going to be the key to moving up in your life. Um, so, you know, it's easy for those types of children who are raised in the U.S. to already know about the legal financial systems and so on. Um, but essentially, they were told from a young age that the ultimate badge of success, so to speak, was getting a salary job, right? Mm -hmm. Their professional focus was getting to a level of stability that their parents didn't necessarily have. So with that, the, the savings and spending habits kind of, um, kind of like tentacle from there, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the focus of saving and spending is, is quite different <laughs> between the two. Now, it may be that from parent to child, you've absorbed something. Um, when I was really young, the focus was on saving. So I focused on saving, right? But I was never taught anything about investing. So, right. and there, yeah, and, the, and I don't know many people um, in, in a similar circumstance that were taught about investing. It was mostly saving, right? Saving the money that you made. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that got me very far in life as far as where I'm concerned. But if you already have a lack of knowledge to begin with, you can only impart so much knowledge to the next generation. So true, and, yes, so true. And it goes on and on, right? So I think the habits of each type of population um, is reflective of their own experiences and how they grew up and how they lived in the U.S. I, so again, so many gems that you are dropping. We would need a few more episodes of this podcast interview, but I do want to touch upon um, something and, and ask you, this would lead into our next question. So as you were mentioning that um, the savings and spending habits of each group um, it's dependent upon their experiences growing up and their and what that contributed to their knowledge base, right? It said that um, this generation is going to be the first that's less financially successful than their parents. So as a financial advisor, how could you serve as an advocate to kind of bridge that gap? Because that to me is frightening because again, as a child of immigrants myself, I was told education, savings, make that what you do. But then I wasn't told beyond savings what to do with that money. And so as a parent, I wonder, you know, if this statistic is, is if this trend, I should say, is continuing to be true, then I want to, how do I ensure, and how do you help people like me ensure that our children will be actually better financially off than we were? or are? Mm -hmm. And that's a really great question. Um, I would say that that largely boils down to education. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and it's not like the scholarly education that you might traditionally think of when I say education. It's more, if you know that there is a gap in knowledge on your part, you need to team up with somebody or work with somebody who complements that for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is absolutely crucial. There's no shame in asking for help or a second look at things. Um, I think it is, it's it's really difficult to get out of sort of, um, and I'm not saying this applies to everybody, but sometimes you're in a victim mentality of, you know, what do I do? I don't know what to do, woe is me. But they need to, you know, some people are in that phase. Some people are in the, I know I need to make something happen. I just don't know how to do it, right? Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know what resources are out there. I don't, I don't know where to start. Um, and then there are others that are a little further along that spectrum that are more, well, I kind of know what I'm doing. I've read a lot. I've done a lot of Google searches. I've self-educated um, and I'm a do-it-yourselfer. I can handle it to a certain extent, 
right? But sometimes it behooves you, whether whatever stage you're at, to ask for help um, mm -hmm. from a professional who does this day in and day out, right? Um, I think it doesn't hurt to ask questions. I completely agree. I, I always tell people, I know what I know, but I for sure know what I don't know, and that's what I need help with always. And, and I love that, that you said there's no shame to that, because I think a lot of times people, regardless of um, their age per se, but I think it's more dependent upon their experiences, um, they tend to feel embarrassed at not knowing something, particularly when it comes to discussing money. And I think that can also be cultural because um, what I've found is um, with having friends from many and varied backgrounds, um, the way that we speak about money and salaries and things like that, um, it, growing up as I did, it's considered very impolite to talk about how much money you make. And yet I have a friend um, who grew up in Germany and she's always comfortable asking me, how much did I get paid for this? How much did I get paid for that? And I had to really readjust and, and shift my perspective to understand that that's not rude. It's just, it's an open conversation for her. You know, it's just a way of her um, exchanging ideas and giving feedback on, oh, well, maybe you should um, try to do this in order to get more, like work smart and not hard, which I understand. And I love those conversations, but it does take me aback every once in a while when she's like, so how much did you get paid for that? I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't, <laughs> you know? So I do know that that, that is my hangup. <laughs> and so I need to work my mind around having that particular conversation with her about certain things, right? So it's comfort level. And and I always say, um, even though I work in the field of diversity and inclusion, there I still have this whole, you know, luggage set of my own cultural experiences that I bring with me. And I have to remember that not everybody is carrying those bags. Everyone has their own separate set of luggage. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Good analogy. Um, that's a great analogy. Um, to to complement that one of like a, a financial advisor essentially is like a pilot on a plane. Mm -hmm. You're deciding to buy this ticket to go on this trip and the pilot can get you there. There's tools to help you along the way, but they're not gonna be responsible for weather. They're not gonna be responsible for delays at an airport, right? Very true. So they're there to help you get to where you wanna be, but there's not, there's, they can't control everything along the way. I, I love that. I love that. That is a wonderful compliment. So for our listeners out there, think about luggage and your pilots. So think about <laughs> air travel when you're thinking about your finances. So then what we're going to wrap up with is what two things would you like to impart upon our listeners today? What would you like them to know? Yes. Um, first of all, um, pertaining to my industry, nobody has a looking glass into the future. Um, it just doesn't exist. But there are guardrails that advisors can provide to help you determine a path that works best for you relative to your goals and your money. And those guardrails are always going to be customized to your personal situation because it's your money, your life, and your goals. Um, the second one is kind of in tandem with the first, and it's, it's a phrase that I learned in, in economics class. And it's, the phrase is, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, in other words, you can't get something for nothing. So you have to put in the work to get to where you want to be. That's that it, that's true with a career. And it's no different with financial advice. You know, a financial advisor can tell you to do X, Y, Z all day, every day, because she knows that doing so is going to get you closer to your goals. But it's still up to you to make that happen for yourself. Wonderful, wonderful. So for our listeners out there, Serena and I want you to ask questions, right? And move from being reactive to proactive. And so I love that, your money, your life, your goals. I think when, when you put it in that perspective, it really, at least from my perspective, it really makes me want to be as proactive as I can be and learn as much as I can about money. And this is something that I dare say I've started to learn later on in my life, which, you know what, is the right timing for me simply because I'm able to digest it now and fully appreciate what that is, you know? So everybody do go at your own pace, as you said, but I definitely think moving from that place of reaction to, to being engaged, actively engaged and involved in your own financial well-being, you know, with partnering with someone like yourself, I think that's really an important step for all generations to take. 
So having said that, Serena, tell our listeners where they can find you. What are your social media handles? Where can they follow you? Uh, Yes, my presence is mostly on LinkedIn, and you can just search for my first name and last name, Serena Shu. I am also on Facebook. Those are my main two social media accounts. Can you tell us quickly about your group that you have on Facebook? Yes, so I have a group on Facebook. I've called it Bright Ideas. Mm-hmm. And it's simply a forum for those who are interested in just reading the articles that I read, because um, I enjoy reading a lot of the, the finance-related articles that are out there in the world. I post them, sometimes with commentary, sometimes not. But it's of interest to me, and if it's of interest to you, you're welcome to join the group. And I've got to tell everybody, please do follow Serena, especially for Bright Ideas, because I personally enjoy it, and I am not somebody that um, traditionally has liked reading about finance or things that are financial, but you post articles that are relatable. Um, The commentary is fun and I like how it feels like you're speaking directly to me and the articles really, I can't tell you enough what a wonderful resource I think you've created by creating this group. Well, thank you so much. So on that note, everyone, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast, and let's keep the conversation going. Follow us on our social media channels, on Facebook, and on LinkedIn. Let us know what you thought about our interview. Let us know what you want more of, and follow Serena's advice. So until next time, everyone, I'm your host, Bertine Crevacore west and I'll catch you next time. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going, going, going.